Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for our third installment of Finding the Source. Uh, my name is Ashley Lusky, and I'm the Assistant Director of the Civil War Institute at Gettysburg College. Unfortunately, my usual partner in crime, Pete Carmichael, uh, can't join us this evening because he is feeling under the weather. Um, but I am in good company tonight um, with two uh, very uh, distinguished scholars, um, as young as they are. They have produced some very uh, exciting work on guerrilla warfare, um, joined by Dr. Matthew Hulbert, who is an assistant professor of history at Hampton Sydney College, and Dr. Andrew Fialka, who is assistant professor of history at Middle Tennessee State University. Um, before we get into kind of the nuts and bolts of tonight's discussion on guerrilla warfare, I will let you know that this is a pre-recorded session. So we are actually recording on a Friday afternoon. Um, obviously this means that we can't respond to live questions or comments during the feed, but we still encourage you all to leave any comments or questions that you might have uh, if you'd like to interact with each other on the discussion feed. Um, but thank you all again for, for tuning in and joining us. And I have to say uh, before we start out that we are joined uh, by a new father of three uh, this evening. Uh, Matt uh, just had a new baby. How many weeks ago was it? Uh, she was born on the 7th. On the 7th, okay. So Almost three weeks ago. Okay, so Matt is very generous with his time and it's uh, amazing to me that you're still awake uh, considering wrangling three young children. Um, so uh, thank you, Matt, for joining us. Uh, and of course, thank you, uh, Andrew, for your time as well. So our topic tonight is, of course, uh, guerrilla warfare during the Civil War, irregular warfare. And it is one of the more increasingly popular topics of interest in Civil War history. It wasn't always, but I think it has kind of come to the forefront more so in recent years. Although as we will kind of unpack in today's discussion, some of the reasons why it is so popular are maybe built on some fuzzy assumptions or from maybe even some um, exaggerated or sensational uh, memories of guerrilla warfare and what actually went on in the border states during the Civil War. But luckily we have Matt and Andrew to help to unmuddy the waters for us today as we work our way through some of their scholarship um, the two texts that we'll be talking about um, kind of most specifically, although we'll be talking about the evolution of the study of guerrilla warfare uh, in the Civil War in general. Uh, this is Matt's recent book, The Ghosts of Guerrilla Memory, How Civil War Bushwhackers Became Gunslingers in the American West. Show it to you all so you can get a good glimpse of it. And also an article by Andrew in this book an edited collection, The Civil War Guerrilla, Unfolding the Black Flag in History, Memory, and Myth, which was actually co-edited by Matt and Joseph. Is it Baleen? Baleen? Beeline. 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 Okay. Yeah. Beeline. Um, and Andrew's article, um, we'll get to a little bit later, um, has a, a long and interesting title, um, which we'll unpack uh, as we talk about some of the unique methodologies that he uses to complement some of the more traditional uh, scholarship that Matt has tackled in his book. I'd like to get us started by first asking you all what, what attracted you all to the topic of studying guerrilla warfare and irregular warfare. I know, Andrew, I've known you much longer than I've known you, Matt, and I know that you grew up in Missouri, so I'm curious if, if that was kind of the, the driving force behind your interests or if there was something else, and definitely I want to know, Matt, uh, your perspective as well. Uh, do I take the lead on this one, Matt? Go for it. Yeah, mine was all happy, dumb luck, uh, to be quite honest. I was, uh, I've been a musician for much longer than I've been a, a, a serious student. Uh, I played drums for, I don't know, 20 years or something like that. So when I got to, time to write an undergraduate thesis, that's kind of what I wanted to write about. Um, and it just wasn't working out. I wasn't, I wasn't interested in anything uh, that I was finding. And uh, my advisor at the University of Missouri was a scholar named Leanne Weitz. Um, and she was a Civil War scholar there. And her student at the time was Joseph Beeline. Um, and um, I had sort of gotten close with her through a research methods class. And um, 
just sort of mistakenly became Joe's friend too. So I, I, I kind of backed into it. And when I had to, I was in the honors college, so I had to write an honors thesis. And I didn't think, I didn't think to pick a subject that I was interested in. I just thought, I'm going to pick the professor that, you know, has shown me the most attention because I'm going to need help getting through this thing and figuring this out. And that was Leanne. She's, um, you know, the amount of time she sacrificed for an undergraduate is, is uh, it's really hard for me to put into words the impact that she had on me and how much time she, uh, she gave to me. Um, and Joe, I know Joe would say the same thing. Um, so it was sort of a happy accident. And then, you know, I was in Missouri, the sources were right there. Um, it was all very just based on place. Um, uh, and that's the scholarship Joe was doing. That's the scholarship Leanne was doing. And so I sort of, um, I sort of just really followed in their footsteps and was a, a, a protege of, of those two. Yeah, and certainly, I mean, I'm most familiar with Leanne's work um, and how much she's done on this particular topic. Um, and certainly, you know, the, the edited volume has exposed me more um, to Joe's work as well. Um, so I, I, that doesn't surprise me that this would be the source of inspiration for you. I'm curious, <laughs> growing up in Missouri, did you visit um, sites related to guerrilla warfare in the state at all? Was, was that specifically driving any of this interest in addition to Leanne kind of showing you the way and saying, hey, this is a topic that you might be interested in? Or was that something that might have come after the fact? Yeah, none, zero. Um, I grew up in Springfield. I'm from Kansas City, which is why I'm repping this today. Um, I grew up in Springfield, Missouri, which is in the southern part of the state. It's sort of a little more Bible belty down there. Uh, but Wilson's Creek, that battlefield is down there. So my only introduction to the war was, a, you know, an eighth grade field trip or something like that out to Wilson's Creek. Uh, uh, Creek. I think I'd been out there a couple times. Um, but, you know, Kansas City is so big uh, and there, there are good um, there are good historical societies there and projects there, but it's, it just wasn't on a kid's radar. Um, and so I didn't know anything, uh, until I got to, uh, until I got to Columbia, uh, that's where the university of Missouri is in the middle of the state. And the, um, uh, the Centralia massacre site is just, I don't know, a 15 or 20 minute drive away. Yeah. So there's not, you know, as far as public history goes, there's not a lot. Um, yeah, and you kind of have to. You, you kind of got to do what Matt did and drive around to these graveyards in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, um, that was the topic that I, I figured that we'd end on is actually kind of bringing us <laughs> into the present. And I, I understand why, even growing up in Missouri, um, you know, this wasn't really on your radar because it doesn't seem to be on a lot of people's radar these days, and hasn't been for some time in terms of you know markings on the landscape or interpretation. Um, so that makes perfect sense and. You know, you mentioned the geography of the state of Missouri too, which is something that I'd like us to um, to get into as well. But um, but first, Matt, I want to hear from you. What what drove you to research this topic? Well, I would love to say that I had a more of a grand master plan than Andrew did, but honestly, uh, my initial interest, like probably a generation of kids who just liked Western movies, my initial interest was in the James brothers and the younger brothers and that sort of, you know, period where Western Missouri and Kansas are the wild west. And as I delved into those figures, uh, you know, if you go back far enough, you hit the war and, you know, you kind of get that little light cartoon light bulb that says, wait a minute, why do I think of them as cowboys and gunslingers? and not as, you know, diehard Confederate guerrillas from, you know, deeply held, you know, deep, deep enslaved country. Um, you know, you wanted to talk about geography later. I mean, they're from the heart of Little Dixie. So, I mean, that's really kind of the underlying question of ghosts. And so in some ways, what I walk through in the book is basically what I stumbled through as a graduate student, kind of answering that question for myself uh, and why, you know, at this point, sadly, when you ask students who Jesse James is, they either think of the motorcycle guy, who I think dated Sandra Bullock, maybe for a little while, um, or they think of no one. But for people old enough, they think of Jesse and Frank James, you know, as gunfighters and, you know, train robbers. Why is that? Uh, when 
you know, they actually spent the better part of their lives doing something else. Uh, but unlike Andrew, I grew up in Florida, pretty much as far from, you know, the reaches of Western Missouri as you could get. So for me, the first time coming to Columbia and Kansas City and uh, Rolla and St. Louis and Jefferson City, it was, you know, it was like grad school Disneyland uh, because I kind of hit all of this stuff at once. And like Andrew mentioned, there's not a ton of stuff that you can still visit. That's sort of just part of the, you know, herb or the, the domestic side of guerrilla warfare, but places like the Centralia site um, are fantastic. You can still go walk the ground. You can take like a walking tour of Lawrence. Joe and I got a parking ticket in Lawrence. Somehow that seemed fitting uh, when we were there exploring. But so it's, it's interesting. And I think Andrew and I are not unusual in that a lot of people who end up studying this, they kind of come to it in weird ways. And I think that's because it, for a long time, it just hasn't been a mainstream thing. You almost had to sort of find it in the back of the garage, you know, stumble into it in the dark. Um, but it's, it is getting bigger now, I think. It's okay. more mainstream now, certainly, than it was when Andrew and I started looking at it. Right, right. Yeah, no, I think it definitely has become more mainstream. And of course, some of the reason for that is people's fascination with the sensational stories, which aren't entirely historically accurate. There are some grains of salt, um, some grains, more grains than others, uh, depending on the topic that you're talking about. Um, but people do have a fascination with the topic because of the, the romance of it and the excitement of it. Um, and of course, pop culture, which we'll talk about a little bit later in our discussion. Um, can you kind of get us started, Matt, with orienting us to what primed Missouri to be the stage for this big contest of guerrilla warfare. In your book, I thought you did such a great job outlining the certain factors. There's geographical factors, there's political factors, cultural issues, social issues, ethnic issues that roll into why Missouri becomes the site of so many of these guerrilla episodes. So I'm wondering if you can kind of give us a, a Cliff Notes version of that to help our, our audiences understand how guerrillas came to dominate uh, so much of the, the warfare that takes place there during the Civil War years. Sure. Well, I can at least try. And then you guys can tell me if I did a bad job. Uh, Andrew can fix it uh, if I did a bad job. Basically, if we sort of step back, we look at the war, but step back in the process of doing that, it's not just that Eastern War for Emancipation that we tend to, you know, sort of the Ken Burns version of the war. Um, it's really this broader continental conflict where whatever happens in that Eastern realm is going to directly affect what happens in the Western half, which is, you know, sort of this unpainted imperial canvas that we're just waiting to fill in as soon as we settle, what's it going to look like in terms of slavery, who's allowed to live there, what kind of labor will we have? And if you look geographically, you know, at a, even the like middle school color coded version of the map of the United States, Missouri is basically the conduit that connects those two halves. So it's like all of the sort of Civil War vibes that connect imperialism and emancipation, Missouri is the thing that plugs them together. It also helps that it's the physical gateway for people move. I mean, it's, you know, the arches are there for a reason. So basically, we get to a point where Missouri is sort of the westernmost settled place. So we have people piling in with their slaves. We have people piling in without their slaves. And the war basically starts in Missouri a decade before it starts anywhere else. Um, what we see in the 1860s is really just a continuation of what we'd already seen. I mean, Lawrence has been burned once before. I mean, long before Quantrill shows up in 63. So this helps explain why there's so much bad blood in Missouri, because it's almost like the entire war in microcosm. It also explains why so many people don't leave and they choose to, you know, the best answer we have for why men choose to fight as guerrillas is because it was the option that didn't make you leave home. When you join the army, you know, your colonel says, all right, pack it up, guys, we're going to Iowa or we're going to Tennessee, or we're going to Virginia. When you're a guerrilla and you operate within a county orbit, 
you kind of get to more operate, you know, in the manner that you'd like. So we've got a fight that goes on longer. We've got a fight that's on your terms. It's local, which makes it personal. So it's not that you're killing strangers. You're killing that German who you hate because you think he wants to take your slaves away. He's trying to kill you because he hates you because he thinks with your slaves, you're going to undercut his ability to feed his family. So it's, it's sort of all of the violence and all of the political inflection that we see on the national stage condensed down into a state level version. And then because of the geography of the state with the river, slavery ends up in sort of specific places, which is why we get these hot spots that Andrew is probably much more qualified to talk about because he's actually mapped them. Um, so it's, it's really like almost pressure points might not be the right word, but there are flashpoints in Missouri where the violence is in some ways unlike what we see in other places. But as you've mentioned, in other ways, it's sort of overblown. Um, and it's not all that unlike the irregular violence we see in Georgia or Mississippi or anywhere, you know, where armies go. Sure, sure. Yeah. And I think, you know, the way that you set it up with with the map, you know, St. Louis is being kind of the, the hotbed for more industrial growth for, you know, free labor ideology for, you know, cheap arable land that German immigrants who come to America with the idea of I'm going to make it with my own two hands um, and I'm opposed to slaveholders. You know, they're, they're kind of that one subset. And then on the other side, on Andrew's side of the state, um, you have the, the Kansas City people, which is, you know, the last outpost before you hit the frontier. There are, you know, large tracts of land that are farmed by big slaveholders. And then you have that, that upper portion kind of in between the Little Dixie that you talk about, um, where you have lots of Confederate pockets. But every time you see those Confederate pockets, you also have kind of rubbing elbows right next door to them or, or vying for land. You also have the sporadic pockets of, you know, the, the free labor people who turn out to be the unionists during uh, the war. Um, and so that close contact in between those two, you know, very polar opposite cities um, seems to, to be those kind of explosive um, episodes. And, you know, I think you, you touched on a good point about what, what Andrew's done with GIS and with digital mapping tools um, is something that I think you place order and reason and explanation on why guerrilla warfare happens where it does and when it does throughout the war. Um, you know, I think a lot of people come to discussions of irregular warfare, guerrilla warfare during the Civil War and especially in the borderlands, and they think, it's anarchical, there's no pattern, it's random, it's only personal, there's no political ideology, um, it's bloodlust, it, it's just violence. Um, but Andrew, what you found kind of combining, you know, the, the, the logic of the geography and where people settle and the political economies and social structures that stem out of that, combined with how the war is unfolding in the East and then regular armies moving throughout the state, that tells a different story. So can you kind of help to unpack how your methodologies have kind of unmuddied those waters for us and, and placed a map, a, a pattern, um, some organization on what a lot of people have considered to be just utter chaos for so long? Sure. Um, and it's really important to give, pay homage to um, older guerrilla historians that that chaos is there. Um, <laughs> it's brutal. Uh, I mean, if you just Google Centralia massacre, you're gonna see some nasty stuff, um, some really nasty stuff. Um, mutilation, just, you know, the worst the war has to offer. So, I mean, there's a reason that that article that you showed is called Controlled Chaos. Uh, I left chaos in there. And my manuscript is Of Methods and Madness. Uh, so that stuff still stays, but it's, it's not, you know, I, I think it was a lot, very unbalanced. And so in trying to map this stuff, which I got the idea from actually working at the Park Service, I had that seasonal gig at uh, Fredericksburg and Spotsylvania National Military Park. Actually, still have my hat. Yeah. A Green Beret offered to trade me his beret for that bad boy. I uh, didn't take him up on it. Um, but we, we started, they trained us to start the, our tours at the maps. And so I'm sort of um, like 
you know, working at the parks all day. And then at night I'm, I'm reading through the guerrilla historiography as fast as I can for my master's degree. And I just have this light bulb that there's there's not a single map in any of these books. Um, so what happens when you throw everything on a map um, is that where, where Southerners, where the population of Southern sympathizers lived where reports of guerrilla violence are and where union occupiers were is all in the same space. Um, and so what we had, the conclusions that we had already come to through qualitative methods that women um, are supporting guerrillas. And if you, if you eliminate the women, you eliminate guerrillas ability to operate. Um, and that guerrillas are targeting union occupiers. Um, and that one, that, I guess that's the, the bigger one that the maps revealed, is that, that this idea that you were talking about, the guerrillas are just sort of wandering around murdering anybody. Um, that goes on. Um, but a lot of the time, uh, a huge chunk of the time, they're targeting union occupiers, or they're targeting railroads that the Union Army is using, or they're targeting telegraph lines, uh, or they're targeting uh, ships, um, uh, the Navy, on the Missouri River. So... What the maps did was sort of bring a sense of balance, I think, into trying to understand violence, which is all we're doing in the conventional war. You know, when you throw bars and regiments and, and, and the, the blue and red blocks, uh, like the amazing Civil War Trust, the battlefield animated maps, um, all that is is trying to make sense of people filling each other with lead. Um, and that's really what the, the, it's done the same thing in guerrilla studies, I think. It's just given us another tool to try to make sense of, of all the violence that goes on. And then the violence is nasty um, and, and brutal, and it, I think it deserves all those terms because it is so personal, and you've got Bowie knives and, and things like that going on. Um, um, but, yeah. And so you talk about the, um, the union occupation as being kind of a – um, a flashpoint for drawing these guerrillas out to places that are occupied. Obviously, they're not, guerrillas aren't going to go after mainstream St. Louis because it's a, you know, a permanently held union city uh, for much of the time. Um, but it's the temporary union outpost, right, that seem to attract the, the guerrillas um, kind of in the, in the wake, um, either to, you know, take supplies or to, um, you know, get uh, retributive justice, um, what, whatever you want to call it. Um, and yet, of course, as Leanne Weitz and so many other scholars have said, and as Matt says in his book, for so many people living in Missouri, the guerrilla war was a domestic war. And you just spoke to it too, is that, you know, women were, um, you know, actively, you know, feeding armies, they were um, ushering supplies back and forth, they were providing, you um, you know, information for uh, gorillas. They were taking care of gorillas uh, who were her sick or wounded. Um, and so when you see all of these episodes of brutal violence that occur um, upon civilians who are taking an active role, uh, you know, women um, and children even, um, how, how does that square with what you found about um, the, the gorillas largely trying to target union forces and union occupied areas? How it squares with it. I mean, so Matt, when we were in graduate school, Matt used a term called day tripping gorillas. <laughs> I don't even know if you remember this, Matt. I do, I still okay. use it. I don't know if it's <laughs> caught on with our colleagues yet, uh, but we're working on it. So, what Matt meant by day tripping gorillas, where you know you there, there's the names that you've heard of Quantrill and Bloody Bill Anderson and the, the James brothers and the younger brothers, then there's these people that just sort of show up, um, and we don't really know. It's very hard to find out who they are, and it's very hard to understand how committed they were. Their targets are the same. Was it civilians or was it? this guy who was in the home guard or a vigilante committee um, or, you know, some sort of quasi militia unit. 
um, there's this giant gray area. And, and that's kind of how I think scholars have tried to, you know, square this away. Just to get back to your question is that um, like the, the term now, I can't believe this is just perfectly sitting here, is, is household war. Uh, and the idea is that, okay, battlefield, home front, eh, they're sort of, they're sort of a little bit more mixed uh, than, than, than studying a battle leads us to believe, and the participants are the same way. Um, so, I mean, how we're trying to square it away now is to say that uh, all these categories that we have, which are really useful for understanding how wars work, um, are not really useful for understanding how people go through them or experience them. Um, which doesn't mean we throw them out the window. <laughs> uh, it just means that we're trying, we're trying to come up with new things right now. I mean, I don't know if I heard the term household war before two or three years ago. Um, I don't know, Matt, what do you think? Well, I, I think it's important that Andrew rightfully so and carefully noted what we've typically been led to believe um, because a lot of what most people think about what happens in the guerrilla war is really just a derivative of what they believe they know happens in the regular war. And it's been set up as a foil intentionally so um, as a way to sort of cleanse the regular war. I mean, there are Bowie knives there. Are, I mean, what happens in the aftermath of the second massacre at Centralia, which Andrew very tactfully has sort of avoided is that men basically have very private body parts cut off and stuffed in their mouths. And then they are posed in very grotesque ways to be found by the Union troops who will come along later. Men are scalped, fingers are taken as trophies. So these are things that we would typically associate with uncivil, right, savage warfare, especially the scalping. But when we really stop and think about it, I mean, think about what happens when Pickett's men hit the wall on the third day at Gettysburg, or think about what happens, you know, on Marie's Heights, think about the, or the slaughter pin, right? Think about what happens to these guys who are on regular traditional battlefields. The violence is awful and savage there as well, but a lot of what I work on, which sort of, you know, meshes very well with what Andrew's mapping is, how the guerrilla war has basically been used to wash away all of the ugliness of the regular war because we love it because it's right it's a shokin farewell and it's you know uh, martin sheen dressed up like robert e lee and it's you know going out to the battlefield parks we don't want to think about guys getting bayoneted in the throat and then you know being left on a battlefield for three days without water as they bleed to death so a lot of it has to do with our misconceptions of just how different I think the guerrilla war is. But some of that also has to do with geography. We started our conversation talking about the borderlands, but to give Andrew more credit uh, than he's taking for himself, what he's mapping, I would bet money would apply in Tennessee or Kentucky or Georgia, anywhere that occupying armies come through and have to interact for prolonged periods of time with Confederate sympathizers or the, the kin of men who are off in the Confederate army, we're gonna see the same patterns and the same concentrations of violence, but the architects of post-war memory, we don't wanna think about guerrilla violence in Georgia or God forbid it's in Virginia, right? Because this would just ruin everything. We don't want a national park site to a massacre of so-called civilians. But then there's that term, and this is what Andrew was getting at with home guards or militias or vigilante committees in the border west specifically, what is a civilian? Um, I, we don't know, I don't know that we even really define it all that well today uh, to the union government, to Thomas Ewing, the women who fed guerrillas in the field were not civilians. He expels them by military order to Easterners you know, who are happy to starve Confederate households in Georgia, that's an abomination that he would evict women from their homes in Missouri, right? Um, so we have these sort of cultural and regional disconnects about what violence is acceptable and who's allowed to wield that violence. And it sort of plays right into how we remember it. 
um, Andrew was the first guy who was smart enough to come along and rather than sort of ramble on and tell you stories about it, like Joe and I do, he actually mapped it. He figured out how to get the computer to tell you the story. Um, Cause when you can see it, you know, it's really pretty stunning, the patterns that he's picked out of this. Sure. No, I, I think that that's very true. And I think that you're, you know, the West or the, you know, the borderlands is being the, the foil to what's going on in the East. It, it does make it the dumping ground for everything that we don't want to consider, um, you know, not civil or savage or unseemly about the romantic, you know, moral war going on in the East. Um, and so, you know, when we look at gorillas, it, it does, it puts them in a, a relatively safe place. Again, that, that has to do with the Westernization that you talk about. And again, those, you know, great Western films that come out where we can say, well, that wasn't really, you know, civil war. That was just the nature of the frontier at the time, rough and tumble. You know, the civil war as we know it, the big battles in the East, the Gettysburgs, the Antietams, um, you know, and Chancellorsville's, those are still the organized combat, the moral combat. Um, that, that we can still get behind. Um, but of course, you know, another component to that is of course that I think a lot of people want to think that what was going on with guerrillas was not politically motivated. There was no ideology, but of course it's, it's deeply rooted, yes, in, in neighborhood wars and household wars and personal attacks, but those personal attacks, you know, are, are occurring because of deeply seated differences about political economy and social structure. And I think that, you know, that point can't be emphasized enough is that these people weren't politically vacant. Um, they, they did have ideologies that they were clinging to, that they were fighting for, but then you ramp that up and combine it with the localized politics of, you know, hey, that guy's my neighbor, um, that adds an extra level of, of brutality to it. And I guess I, I would say too, I don't know if you guys would have an answer to this, but in, in looking at Andrew's work and then looking at your work, Matt, um, Andrew, I think you were the one who said that in areas that were union occupied, guerrillas would be attracted because of atrocities or unfairness committed against um, you know, individuals within that area. And so, they're going after the Union troops who are, you know, terrorizing the landscape. But the Union troops would say, well, the reason why we're treating those people so harshly is because we're, we're afraid and threatened by guerrillas. So which came first, the chicken or the egg? Were the guerrillas there uh, doing their thing? And then it became more ramped up once more regular Union troops came in. Um, or was it more so the presence of, of Union troops came in and as a response, you know, guerrillas really heat up. I don't know if you can answer that or if, you know, it's both of them fed each other, but I'm curious to hear your responses. Yeah, I would say the latter. I mean, the border war is there before the war starts. So before you have a union or a Confederate troop, you've got violence for half a decade. Um, um, you know, Osceola burns down and that's in Missouri. Um, uh, John Brown, of course, this is his fame. You know, they at <laughs> there's a Mizzou KU basketball game not too long ago that the the KU crowd holds up a huge sign of John Brown. I mean, it's still sort of huh. embedded in the wow. in the memory of the of the wow. uh, the border war. So the the violence is yeah, it's already there, um, and it depends how the union brings it in. When the union dumps a couple of regiments in St. Louis, things calm down. Um, they're doing, Stephen Ash is just a great historian who's, who showed sort of what the Union Army is doing in cities as far as sanitation and schools and jobs and all this sort of stuff. But 2,000 Union troops in a city is not a cavalry, you know, patrol of 20 guys in the middle of Missouri. Um, and that's a lot of what I found out is sort of, um, Tem I called it temporary union occu occupation, but raids, scouts, expeditions, these things sort of pour fuel on the fire. They're undisciplined. Uh, well, it just depends on the officer, of course, but there's a greater chance for them to be undisciplined. And that's where you get, um, you know, the idea of a federal tyrant comes true for Southern sympathizing population and the, the need 
uh, if you're rooted in, in Southern honor and Southern manhood to respond to that with violence, uh, it's all there. So, yeah, I really steer away from the chicken or the egg debate, but the, um, if I had to answer it, um, the violence is created in the context of slavery and the whole system of slavery that the state economy is run on is, you know, violence supports the system of slavery, physical violence, sexual violence, familial violence, um, you know, what rendition it takes or, or I mean, we're all talking about the same thing. Yeah. I think to Andrew's point, there's actually, and he's hit on it, he just hasn't named it. There's really a third option, and I hesitate to carry our like chicken or egg metaphor to, you know, sort of an artificial form of genesis here. But really, I think what we're talking about in that initial, you know, sort of back and forth to border war, it doesn't necessarily have to be intra Missouri violence. What helps trigger the violence in Missouri is a back and forth across the Missouri Kansas border. So in a lot of ways, the violence that is being responded to late in the border crisis and then early in the war is really spilling over from Kansas. This is what conservative Missourians are whining about. It's these Jayhawkers come across the border. They do this horrible stuff to us. And then when we shoot back at them, everyone says we're criminals and we're terrorists. And then you know, a garrison ends up in our town. And then we end up mixing it up with the garrison who, you know, some of the time are outside troops. Some of the time it's just the same guys from the neighborhood who got wrangled into putting on blue coats. And, you know, you've known them your whole life. So there is this sort of personal animosity. Um, so there's almost like that outside jumpstart that sort of precludes having to have just the chicken or the egg, but a lot of this also depends on where the Missourians came from. These are the descendants of Virginians who want to live in a place that is essentially Virginia, but they're too late. They've been shut out of, there's no accessible land. There aren't accessible cheap slaves. Missouri is like the last best option. They get here and then to the west of them, there are these Kansans who are gonna ruin everything because they genuinely believe that if slavery can't expand, it's gonna die. So basically like they'll be the last part of the vine before it starts to wither. And all of these dreams of, you know, bringing the old South further into the West are gonna go away. So there is this personal aspect to it because it's neighbors, uh, you know, and even family members who are killing each other. But there's also this idea that you are taking away the dream that I came here for and I will fight you to the death for it. And that's going on for a decade, right? Before, you know, anybody starts, decides to start lobbing shells in Charleston. Um, so people, when the war begins, kind of look at Missouri, Missouri and say, whoa, what is wrong with those people? How did they go from one to 10 on the like, you know, vengeance or animosity scale so quickly? What well, they don't realize because it was, it was the frontier. Who cared what was happening? in Missouri or Kansas before 1861. Um, but they, they ratcheted up to 10 over the course of a decade, essentially. It's just sort of news to the East. Um, but that sort of gets back to your initial question. Uh, it's just been going on there much longer. Uh, so, you know, there's sort of a longer explanation necessary. Right. And, you know, you, you talk about in your book, and of course, both of you are very well familiar with these debates about um, how much focus should we put on guerrillas and irregular warfare uh, when, you know, considering the numbers, the vast majority of people experience the war in a, in a regular context, right, not in an irregular context. So why should we shift our gaze so much to the West and to these very graphic, brutal, um, you know, unseemly and savage engagements that are going on um, in Missouri. But, you know, what you just said right there about, you know, this is a, the seeds of the war were planted in the West, in, in those border states in the future of, are they gonna become slave states? Are they going to become free states? Um, and so much of, you know, bleeding Kansas and the, the crisis of the 1850s, that's, that is the war, that's the center of the war. Um, and so really, you know, when we, when we talk about center and periphery with the war, I get it that, you know, most of the war 
numbers wise is going on in the east um, and most people are experiencing regular warfare but there's certainly a strong argument to be made that the seeds of war were planted in Missouri and then we see it kind of the just again controlled but still chaos unfold from that explosion of passions and tempers and again political ideologies um, that you know were, were repackaged and reframed for people back east um, but but not for people back west um, and of course this creates numerous issues after the war when thinking about well how are we going to understand what happened in Missouri how are we going to repackage guerrilla warfare and make it um, okay or justifiable how are we going to, to talk about it explain it away Robert E Lee of course you know at the end of the war when the idea is put forth you know maybe we should all just disband and become partisans and he said no 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 that's only going to make things worse so you can imagine you know his his response to what was going on uh you know in missouri and in some of the other border territories with you know this irregular warfare but we have all these competing threads of memory so i'd like to to kind of get into a lot of that and i know it's very complex matt and you've done really great, great work in your book here, unpacking how the evolution of memory occurs in the post-war years and into the early 20th century and even up through, through today. But let's talk about the lost cause and how the guerrilla narrative could fit, couldn't fit uh, within the lost cause narrative and who some of the key players were in trying to find a way to move forward from the Civil War, um, but finding a place for guerrillas within that narrative. Absolutely, and I think it's worth, um, I love the Lee story. I mean, you can imagine, just to address this very quickly, I don't think we can let it pass. You can imagine these sort of stuffy, very privileged, I mean, they were his staff officers for a reason, right? And they're all thinking, like, let's go camp in the woods and be gorillas and we'll show those Yankees, you know, what it's like, because my uncle used to take me deer hunting. Um, they have absolutely no idea what it means to really operate a household insurgency like what we see go on in Missouri. And had they had any idea and what the consequences would have been for their own household, which presumably would have had to support them, I don't think they would have thought it was such a hot idea. Um, and, you know, I don't know that we know all that much about Lee's mindset in that moment specifically to do with this topic, but I like to think he at least had an inkling of what the union response to widespread guerrilla warfare is going to be. I mean, imagine order number 11 in Missouri, but writ large across Virginia or across Georgia. It's going to be a pretty ugly picture uh, and the South has kind of been beat up enough. But anyway, to the question that you actually asked about, sorry, I couldn't let it go. To the question that you actually asked about memory, right after the war, we hit this really interesting sort of fork in the road. We've got to figure out what we're going to do with these guys because the war that they've been fighting doesn't look like the one that the majority of Americans um, experience, but there are an awful lot of people for whom the guerrilla war was the regular war. So this is something that has to be reckoned with very quickly. These sort of ground floor architects of the lost cause decide, you know what, our best bet here, and this sort of fits within the Blightian model of memory, or, you know, Carrie Janey has sort of come along and tweaked it as well. It fits very much within this accepted model. Um, we essentially see North and South reuniting on the idea that we can reconcile around a brother's war with mutual honor and chivalry and man, we fought each other like hell, but at the end of the day, we shook hands and had a beer and went home and you know, we were buddies again, but those long hairs out in Missouri who were scalping people and mutilating genitals and stuff, we don't wanna be associated with them. They sort of ruin this genteel idea that we're old world Europeans who, you know, essentially dueled each other for four years and then shook hands and went home. So you've got to figure out a way to write them out of the story. Guerrillas and they're, you know, the people who experienced the war as an irregular conflict, 
they freak out because they're they're seeing in real time that they're going to be whitewashed from the story. So rather than trying to mold their experiences to fit Eastern ideas of the war, they say, you know what? We are going to go all in on this guerrilla thing. We're going to not only show how we were different, and this is largely the work in Missouri of John Newman Edwards, who I'm um, slowly suffering through a biography of. That's a whole other uh, interview for another day. Um, he basically says, I'll make you guys the most Confederate of all. Because if those pansies in the gray uniforms had really had guts, they would have fought the war the way you did. They would have fought it to the knife under the black flag. And we wouldn't be talking about a surrender at Appomattox because it would still be going on. Um, his idea, because he's not even a guerrilla himself, is he lives in Missouri. He doesn't want Missouri to become detached from the rest of the ex-Confederacy. He's desperately trying to find something that will link it to the lost cause. So we basically end up with this irregular or guerrilla lost cause with its own pantheon of heroes. Andrew mentioned Quantrill, Bloody Bill Anderson, the Jameses, the Youngers, Jim Jackson, uh, Holtzclaw, pretty much any guerrilla who was notorious enough during the war to show up by name and official reports is going to get a place in the Edwards pantheon. The issue is once Reconstruction sort of fades away, Edwards is successful and he doesn't need these guys anymore and he drops it. And then you still have this whole generation of guerrillas left thinking, well, what the hell do we do now? Um, so they hold their own reunion. They're, I mean, this is bizarre. They have their own little, it's like Gettysburg, but it's in Kansas City, right? They have their own reunions with their own ribbons and parades. They drag out this portrait of Quantrill and they pose with it for photographs every year. Um, it's really kind of creepy the way he turns into sort of a cult figure, you know, because of what he's best known for. But they do this into the 1920s, basically, until the last of them dies. And then at that point, it kind of fades away. And to very quickly address a, a very astute point that you brought up before um, about the political inflection, the reason that it sort of just became relevant to talk about the politics behind guerrilla war is because multiple generations of historians didn't. We looked at them as criminals, or there was something called the bloodlust theory, which was basically these were sociopaths who just liked killing, so guerrilla war fit. And that carries through up into the 80s. It's really not until like the 90s and really the present uh, that we've gone back and assessed the actual politics, the, the Confederate credentials behind what these guys are doing, um, because partly they're their own victims. They commemorated themselves as like the anti-hero Confederate Rambos, and then historians ran with that, uh, you know, for 60 years. I'll be quiet now. We could go on about this forever, but right. it's probably not uh, what anybody wants to hear. No, I mean, I think it's interesting because it does take on so many forms. And, you know, what, what Edwards does so masterfully is he indulges, you know, the the guerrilla, you know, brutality and, you know, the, the violence, the rape, the arson, all of that. He owns it uh, fully, but he says this was morally justifiable. It was necessary. Um, it was it was politically and ideology, mo you know, ideologically motivated. Um, this wasn't empty, you know, killing. We had no other choice, you know. People back east, they're fighting their neat little battles, um, but this is the way we do things out here, and this is how we had to take care of things. And it was it was more successful uh, in our minds uh, than what went on back east. Um, but then, of course, things change, as as he said, uh, you know, when when he dies, and when you know some of these these veterans. Um, you know, start to realize, well, you know, where is our place now in the narrative? And then all of a sudden, we have that retooling of the memory of uh, Confederate guerrillas to fit, maybe toning down some of those edges to fit more of the um, gentlemanly lost cause, maybe kind of toning down, um, you know, the, 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 the violence committed um, you know, wantonly that again, it, it was justified, but, um, you know, putting women out there to help, you know, um, 
put the the Confederate guerrillas cause up on a pedestal and saying, you know, well, you know, we're, we're going to praise these women for what they did during the war. Um, but, you know, we're, we're saying that we are acting in defense of our women, which, of course, is a key pillar of the lost cause. Um, you know, they they again get into the racial issues. They try to kind of, you know, gloss over the racial issues that were a central part uh, driving, you know, the, the start of the war. Um, but I think it's really fascinating how women become problematic in that retelling because they are so, so key as Carrie Janey and so many other people have, have pointed out, they're, they're critical to propping up the lost cause in the East as well as the West. And of course, the first UDC chapter comes out of Missouri, uh, United Daughters of Confederacy. And so these women, they knew that they played an active part in the war. They knew that they too were responsible for killing some men with passing on information that would lead to the murder or, you know, horrible atrocities that were committed during the, uh, the fighting. Um, they, they were key players, but that doesn't square with the lost cause picture of Southern women as being passive and weak and needing protection from men. So can you, and, and Andrew, if you want to jump in on this too, kind of walk us through how those ideas of, of gender and, 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 Missouri women saying, hey, you know, we had a role to, to play and we're not going to forget. Um, how does that square with male guerrillas saying, well, we kind of need you to promote the lost cause, but, you know, we also know that we need to butter you up and make sure that your story is told too, uh, so that we can ensure our place in history. How does the gender component play out here? I'm going to let Matt deal with everything memory, but I just want to say if anti-hero Confederate Rambo is not the name of your next book, then I'm, I just don't think I'm going to read it. It's, uh... well, all right. Well, we'll, we'll talk to the press about that. Um, it's really this interesting intersection of power because whether we're talking about the irregular or the regular lost cause, women run the show largely because women socially and politically are the only ones who can really fundraise for these things. I mean, the last two years, we've had this big discussion about what to do with monuments and statues and these other things. All of them have that little, you, you know, the less we forget UDC plaque. What people don't always realize is that's because the UDC paid for it because they were the only ones. If you were a Confederate veteran, you couldn't go around with the hat out. That was unmanly, right? That was women's social work. And they were seen as non-threatening, right? Because yeah. if you're a woman, you can't possibly have political influence, right? And yet that's exactly what they were doing was advancing a political narrative. But it's and safe. they know <laughs> it. They figure out very early on, wait a minute, we're the ones with all the money. Why are we letting these old beard guys tell us, you know, what to do? We can kind of, you know, exert some influence here. And there's this brief window in the borderlands, specifically in Missouri, where women do realize, hey. We were active belligerents in this guerrilla war, not just as quartermasters. There's this great volume they publish uh, in the late teens, early 20s, where women basically tell the stories of when their husbands are gone. They're hitting Union soldiers in the head with axes. They're fighting people off their kids. They're doing all kinds of stuff that you would never label as civilian activities. And they want the world to know that not only were our husbands the most Confederate, you know, a la Edwards, but we were right there with, you know, to steal a line from that, like we were knee deep in the blood and guts too, right? So that doesn't play well with Eastern audiences. Um, this sort of causes the mainstream lost cause to recoil even more because it's like, my God, not only did you guys fight this basically Indian style war, what have you done to your women that they think it's a good thing? that they right. were hitting people in the heads with axes and stuff. We don't and also what's wrong with, with the men that they couldn't protect them, right? It, it seems yeah. emasculating, even at the same time as you're talking about these atrocities committed by men, it, it seems like, well, the women were left to take care of themselves and so maybe they should have been fighting the yeah. war. So now granted, of course, the Easterners are leaving out, you know, especially like as Sherman marches through, the untold letters that are piling in like, hey, Jim, could you come home? You know, Sherman's men came through and, you know, killed the hogs and everything. It would really help if you were around. Um, so there's, I mean, there are similar situations happening in the East, but men in Missouri, specifically the Quantrill men spearhead this. They basically figure out, we look really bad 
when our women do more than fundraise behind the scenes, we have to sort of shut the door on this or put the lid back on it. So the women as powerful as they are essentially get squelched and they're half willing to do it because they understand that the cause requires it. They very much want to be recognized for what they did, but they realize no one's going to be if people think gender relations are out of whack in the border West. So they basically go back, you know, into the shadows as well. The ironic thing is they were the ones sort of adding real legitimacy to what was going on because their stories are more believable, right? You know, we've talked about the hyperbolic, you know, I had four revolvers and I rode with the reins in my teeth and I gunned down 40 men and stuff. You know, there are parts of truth in that. The story about the lady who catches union bummers in her corn crib and kills them with a pickaxe, she didn't make that up, right? That's just the real deal household war. All of that is lost for decades. Historians don't touch it because all we want to talk about are, you know, scalping and cutting off fingers and stuff like that. We needed Andrew to make us seem civilized and legitimate uh, and intellectual as historians of the guerrilla war. Right. Yeah, I'm curious, Andrew, and in your, in your mapping work, did you attempt to do anything or have you thought about since doing anything on mapping um, monumentation or memorialization efforts in Missouri related to guerrilla warfare? No, uh, there's a lot of, so I work at MTSU. Our public history program is very good. We don't even offer a history PhD. Um, and uh, we actually have hired a digital historian. So I'm sort of just Yahoo in my office who knows one thing. Uh, and there's an actual digital historian who knows a lot. Uh, and she came out of Stanford, um, which has a great, they've got a great digital humanities center there. Um, so we have a lot of students. Um, I mean, I have students that have mapped out uh, Murfreesboro. Murfreesboro is where MTSU is located, uh, who have mapped out the monuments here. And there's a lot of Civil War monuments. The Stones River Battlefield is here. Um, the thing about uh, ARC GIS, ARC GIS, um, just for people who might not know what I'm talking about, it's, a, it's, a, it's sort of the industry standard for geography departments um, for digital mapping and it's a very steep learning curve it's a very very steep learning curve and so um um and then to get data from a 19th century source transcribed and then put into a database and then eliminate all the prejudices prejudices and biases in the database and then transfer that to a map it's just a very um front heavy process so the process I started for my master's thesis is still project number three on my plate right now. Uh, that's just kind of how long it takes. And there are so many issues with quantitative methods that were like um, rightfully <laughs> exposed in the 70s and 80s um, um, when we first adopted these methods. Time on the cross is the most popular one about trying to apply quantitative methods to slavery and violence and how problematic that can be. Um, so I have not done that. I have students who have, but I am, um, uh, I'm, what I'm trying to do now is the uh, official records of the War of the Rebellion and basically take the method that I used in Missouri and say, okay, what does this look like with a national source? Um, because that, you know, just talking about Missouri isn't gonna get people's attention. Uh, it's just not, um, we're sort of our own little thing out here. Um, but you start talking, you do what Daniel Sutherland did and you start talking about gorillas in, in the deep South uh, and out east and now all of a sudden you've got people's attention and he does have a lot of people's attention uh, people know his name for a reason so uh, that's what I'm trying to do is sort of use him as a model and what he was so successful at uh, and and the OR is is you know if you're going to go for a national source that's the one uh, and we also know all the problems with the OR uh, thanks to this wonderful article uh, by um, Yale Sternhill 
I hope I'm pronouncing her first name correctly, uh, the Afterlives of the Confederate Archive, I think is what it's called. Um, so that was a long way of saying no, sorry. <laughs> are, you, are, you mapping, are you mapping gorillas then using the ORs ac across different states or is it a different focus for this project? It's pretty much repeating the same method, so. Um, for gorillas. Yeah, so the OR has, um, gosh, I did the, I did the keyword search. I don't know how many tens of thousands. I can't remember the number right now, but reports of guerrilla violence in the OR. And Matt and I had sort of worked um, on all the diff the terminology for this to, to figure out how to search this thing. Luckily, um, um, there was an NEH, a National Endowment for the Humanities Project at the Digital Scholarship Lab, which is at the University of Richmond. And they were all able to map the Union Army through regimental histories through a, a veteran named Frederick Dyer who came up with these brilliant volumes in what's called Dyer's Compendium. So that we already have a map of the Union Army, but it's at the regimental level. And it's problematic because so many Union occupiers that guerrillas were attacking were not at the regimental level. We're talking companies or cavalry patrols. Um, so this is a this is a monster issue to put guerrillas on the map at a national level, to put the Union Army on a map at a national level at the, at the scale the Union Army was operating at against guerrillas. And that doesn't even talk about the women running the households who are supporting guerrillas, which is also an important layer on the map. So this is a monumental project. Um, it was honestly too big for a dissertation or a master's thesis. Um, and I should have done it at the county level. And I have a student now who I've said, do this at the county level. <laughs> uh, and he's had much more success. Um, but I was, you know, I was really in the dark. There wasn't a whole lot of people doing this um, when I was around and I didn't know where to go for help. Um, and at, I was at the University of Georgia and we were building our, our DH lab from the ground up while I was there. So it wasn't sort of established. Um, so, you know, I'm hoping that people adopt this method uh, and, and build maps of other things. But until, you know, how do you learn the military history uh, that you need to know to be a Civil War scholar and learn all this mapping software uh, in one graduate program? Yeah, you know, that's a tough one to crack. And so it's just going excruciatingly slowly. Right. But also in Andrew's defense on the memory mapping angle, even if you did somehow take in both veins of training, for the most part, the sort of indicators that you would use to map sites of memory in the regular theater, they don't exist or they're not accessible, at least in Missouri's guerrilla theater. I mean, some of the places that do have monuments, they're in people's yard, like they're literally in people's yards um, or there's now a 7-Eleven on top of it or um, Bush Stadium is now on top of it. And then some of these engagements, you know, we think like, well, who couldn't find where a Civil War battle took place? But when you have the diary of some random guy from Clay County saying, we fought a little skirmish out near Phelps's Creek, what does that mean? I mean, that could be 50 different places in a given county. So to try to pinpoint those things with no corroborating evidence, because most of these people leave absolutely no written record, um, it's next to impossible. But that's kind of the story unto itself. The fact that Andrew can map, you know, Michael Fellman called it the War of 10,000 Nasty Incidents. He was probably underestimating, yeah. you know, once we see Andrew's maps, the fact that we know all those little dots took place and there are like four existing monuments. I mean, that unto itself kind of tells us the post-war, the commemorative story of gorillas, at least in Missouri. I would imagine in other places, it's the same, if not even more bare, uh, because I would imagine the closer you got to the Atlantic, the less interested people were in preserving any of this that didn't really fit that mainstream narrative. No, I mean, it, it, it would be impossible to, you know, pinpoint where Sarah's corn crib was or whatever for you know the millions of raids that would have taken place. I wonder if, you know, the things that you can pinpoint, even those structures that don't exist anymore, like, um, was it Lizzie 
Walker, was that her name where the, the Quantrill's reunion was or Lily, Lizzie Wallace? The farm, yes. Yeah, um, that, that no longer exists there. Um, you know, if you could, if that would be a way around, you know, there's no interpretation or there's no kind of visualization. Um, if you can drop a pin there and say, well, here's where it was, you know, the sites where we, we can kind of identify at least within a relatively small um, geographical square um, where something was, if that might be a way around <laughs> this in the future is creating some kind of virtual map tour of these sites so that people don't have to do the Matt Hulbert special and you know, <laughs> all turns AKA down. AKA trespassing. Um, <laughs> the, if, you know, it's, it's interesting. I mean, that's where I think, Andrew, your, your abilities with these digital tools can they're being applied exactly where they need to be applied um, because especially for public history and interpretation where there hasn't been preservation or where things you know, aren't marked, um, but we might know, you know roughly where they were. Perhaps that's where your, your tools can come in handy with kind of repopulating the landscape, even if it's just on a digital basis. Um, so lending. There's, there's, I've got two responses to this, sorry to cut you off. I'm gonna forget. I know I am. We have we have a couple models. Um, so local knowledge is of utmost importance, and it's especially with the Civil War because there's so many Civil War buffs out there. I mean, I pretty much have, every time I teach a Civil War class, I've got a student who's got more knowledge about like Tennessee than I'll ever have ever. Um, and there's a lot of those people out there, and so um, and we have websites that take advantage of this. Clio um, is a really, really good one that sort of has like walking tours built through local knowledge um, that are amazing. So we, it, it can be done. Uh, we haven't, no one's applied it to sort of um, crowdsourcing, you know, specific civil war knowledge or regular knowledge. I've actually written a grant and failed uh, to do this, but there's a model out there. Uh, there's several models that we can use. Another thing that we can use is, um, so Dyer, I mentioned Frederick Dyer earlier. He's this Union veteran that comes up with these, this compendium. He's got one volume on violent events of the Civil War. There's about 12,200, something like that. Well, we use the same code that the Digital Scholarship Lab used to make their uh, map of Union regiments, and we ran that volume through it. Um, and we know, first of all, there's less than 1% of the t over 12,000 violent events of the Civil War are battles, less than 1%. So even though those hold the utmost importance in how the war is run and the politics behind the war and what happens you know, with the Reconstruction Amendments and all this, as far as people's experience goes, it's not battles. Um, that's what they read about in the papers and that's what's turning, you know, pulling the levers behind the curtain. Um, but raids and expeditions and occupations, and those are the things that are happening in the, in the thousands, even in just his count. So, but we've got a map of those too. Uh, we know where a lot of them are. Now, a lot of them are on Joe's Creek. Um, and these are a nightmare, an absolute nightmare to try to pinpoint. And that's what, again, why this work goes so slow, because you're talking about line by line, thousands of lines of data, and you need hyper-local knowledge to pinpoint each line. Um, um, so the models are in place as far as how do we ethically get undergraduate labor to work on this? How do we write a big enough grant to design an app to crowdsource this properly? Um, the guy who started Leo, uh, I presented with him at the National Council on Public History. You know, he had some, he had some personal funds that he started that website with out of his own desire to, you know, bring this to the public. That's not a reality for, for a lot of professors, especially junior faculty. Um, so the models are there, the, the tech is there, but I think the humanities hasn't been great at, um, at using them. I mean, this is a huge problem that most programmers are white guys. Um, these digital humanities labs that can hold these projects are in very few universities that have got the money to do it. Um, so it's, it's a little frustrating. This is why I'm going on this long of a rant because everything's there. Uh, it's ready, it's ready to go, but, but implementing it, doing it ethically, doing it the right way. Um, that is the, 
that's the trick. Sure. Sure. Yeah, I, I can imagine the frustrations if you're in that particular subset of the field and feeling like, you know, we we have the tools, but in terms of getting it off the ground, it's uh, that's a whole other story um, and a story that, you know, these stories need to be told. They desperately have to be told. Um, so so, yeah, I can imagine the, the frustrations. Um, I had kind of a, a two part related question to, to wrap us up um, to kind of bring us homeward into um, the, the final part of Matt's book about how guerrillas did become gunslingers in the American West and this westernization uh, process that occurs in, in memory about guerrillas. So we have all these conflicting chords of memory, the Edwards memory, you know, promoting the, you know, the full on guerrilla, the, the gory graphic, but justified politically motivated violence. Then we have the veterans who come in and say, well, it actually wasn't you know, that bad we fit within the lost cause, you know, ideology more so than you think, you know, tone down those women um, in terms of what they were doing during the war and, you know, help help them, you know, put us more centrally with, with the Eastern lost cause ideology. Um, and then we also have a, another component, which is the memory of um, the unionists in Missouri, um, because of course these guerrillas are, are wreaking havoc on somebody and particularly the, the people of Lawrence, Kansas, who go through uh, the second sacking um, in 1863. Um, I found it so curious that, you know, they of course want to challenge the dominance of, of the guerrilla memory uh, in Missouri. Um, they they want to make sure that, you know, guerrillas like Quantrill especially don't get, you know, the glory as being the, you know, this is what we were put up to do and these evil unionists made us do it and it was totally justified and immoral and all of that. Um, and the way that they, they do that, of course, is through all these interesting means, through, um, you know, the, the burlesques, the theatricals, you know, mocking Quantrill, trying to strip him of his, his masculinity, while at the same time others go out and, you know, portray him as the devil himself, and there is nothing moral or justified about this, and we're completely separated from those people, and we're not going to let them dominate, you know, the history and, and memory um, of what's gone on uh, in our state. And yet then comes in this kind of westernization idea about how, well, you know, maybe guerrillas, they weren't really, it can't really be tied to civil war, you know, politics and ideology. Well, you know, we'll put them in the dumping ground of, of Western history, um, which seems to come out of, again, forces in the East trying to figure out how do we make a nice tidy narrative about the civil war, one that's moral and just and regular, you know, honorable soldiers fighting on the battlefields and then coming together 25 years later, 50 years later and shaking hands over the stone wall at Gettysburg. Um, you know, they're, they're pushing these guys, you know, out further and further into, into the dumping ground of the West. And suddenly the sensationalism is back again. And these people are not at all connected um, to either, you know, political cause and suddenly what's going on in Missouri kind of we ignore the the unionists who are out there. It's just kind of focusing on the the gunslingers. Can you can you talk to us a little bit about the big forces kind of driving that westernization and as you call the Americanization of these guerrillas in historical memory um, and and how that really has kind of gotten a stronghold on on popular culture and American memory today. Again, some of the things that maybe brought you into studying this as, as a field um, because of that romantic idea, idea of you know, the westernization uh, model, but you're really, you know, you're blending um, the history of the Civil War and Reconstruction with the history of the American West and that crystallization of the American identity that comes out of that. So I was wondering if you could kind of speak to us about that to bring us home to to where that that model came from and why that staying power, you know, was was so heavy. Sure. Well, it's I mean, it's it's pretty apparent by the time we get into the 1880s or 1890s, basically leading up to the turn of the century, that the guerrilla bid to be part of the mainstream commemorative landscape of the war has failed. They're never going to be fully integrated. Um, the sins are just the sins of the West are too great to be accepted by these East. You know, Jubal Early is never going to say, you know what, maybe Quantrill actually wasn't so bad. Let's, you know, let's get him in battles and leaders or something, or in the, you know, the Southern Historical Society papers. It's just never going to happen. But 
We also, because of their wartime notoriety, and especially in the cases of the Jameses and the Youngers, they don't just go away after the war. They actually become some of the most famous men in the world. I mean, absolutely in the United States, but they're internationally renowned as bandits in the 1870s. Um, so we've got to figure out something to do with them because we can't just completely make them disappear. This is like one of those weird, convenient moments in history where we have a problem figure in one realm of culture and we have a job opening in another. We are actively doing the imperial work of getting rid of Indians and Mexicans in the West. And we need to put a fun, I mean, it sounds bizarre to say, we need to put a fun, popular face on this, right? So whereas Jesse James um, is totally unacceptable as a chivalrous mainstream Civil War soldier, he's just the hero we need to go, you know, kick the Mexicans out of New Mexico, you know, um, to do this work of clearing the West, of paving the way for American settlement to the Pacific so they get repurposed. And because, uh, you know, as we bleed into the 20th century and, you know, uh, we won't go through the Turner thesis or, you know, we'll see the video views like plunging dramatically when this drops live. Um, but as Western culture becomes a nostalgia piece, you know, as we move up into the 20s and 30s and especially in the Cold War when it's like Gunsmoke, Bonanza, the golden era of Western movies, um, lever action Winchesters are the premier deer hunting rifle in the United States. We need a face to put on that cultural identity. And when we look back, surprise, look who's standing there. It's the James brothers, it's Cole Younger. Um, even though for the most part, they have nothing to do with cattle drives or high noon guns. They have nothing to do with any of the stereotypical things we associate with the West, but they're the ones standing there when we need a face to put on this identity. It gets picked up by pop culture. And, you know, sadly, um, Shocker, pop culture often trumps what historians are writing about. So for 99.8% of the general public, when they see Audie Murphy as Jesse James, that must be what actually happened, not what uh, you know was in a, the one historical book about gorillas published in the 60s, right? So we essentially lost that battle with pop, as historians always lose the battle with pop culture. Um, the interesting thing now that has sort of opened the door for this reexamination is that pop culture swung back the other way. We got Ride with the Devil. We got Cold Mountain. Um, we got Pharaoh's Army. We actually got, I won't say Hollywood did this out of the goodness of their hearts. They did it because they thought it would sell tickets. Um, we got this fortuitous moment where studios thought this is what would sell. So we could sort of jump on that bandwagon and say, hey, not only is that a good story, if you can ignore Tobey Maguire, um, and that's sure. actually pretty close to what really happened. That's the better version that you should be paying attention to. It's not all that often that you get a moment like that, um, where history and Hollywood, even if unintentionally, sort of dovetail together. Um, I will stop because we really could go on about the movies forever. Yeah, no, I think that, I mean, it's fascinating how Jesse James and you, know, you say in your book how most gorillas, they don't survive to make it into, you know, the gunslingers of the West and, and Jesse James is, you know, as TJ Styles says in his book, um, you know, propelled into a lot of the, the robberies and things that he does after the war um, because of the Civil War. So he's definitely a Civil War figure. But on the other hand, he's not representative of most Civil War gorillas. Mm -hmm. Most of them don't become, you know, the gunslinger types. Um, and yet he, he serves in as the fill-in face for the rest of, um, you know, the, the gorillas who may be like Quantrill and, you know, Bloody Bill Anderson and people like that, um, who didn't have any, anything to do necessarily with what goes on after the war um, in terms of the, the social banditry. Um, but it is amazing how he became an easy face for, well, if he's like that, well, all of the gorillas must have been like that. We'll mm -hmm. dump them all in that nice little neat pod of, you know, the Western gunslingers who can, of course, go out and, and do the dirty and necessary job of, you know, getting rid of those Indians and, you know, clearing out the Mexicans and making good on manifest destiny. Um, 
And yeah, I'm so glad that you brought up um, Ride with the Devil. It's one of my favorite Civil War movies. Um, and oh, I think, really? Yeah, <laughs> it is. Um, I think it, you know, it, it does, it provokes a lot. Of course, there are a lot of questions about it and a lot of things that can be read the wrong way, especially with um, Holt, the, the African-American, yes. the slave who's riding alongside, of course, very dutifully. Um, but there are multiple reasons, you know, for, for why he's doing that, you know, self-protection, of course, and um, being high up there. Um, but I think for the reasons that you explain in your book is that it's not necessarily a, a justification and glorification of guerrilla warfare, but it shows kind of the limits of, of where, you know, those necessary interactions um, occurred that were irregular, um, where, where, the, where the limits hit um, in terms of a, a personal basis, what would drive an individual household to go to war with their neighbor. And then when someone would say, ah, oh, it's a little too far beyond me, it had some complexity in there. Um, so I, yeah, I think that's, you know, an interesting one in, in the genre um, to fit in with the outlaw Josie Wales, which probably more people are, are familiar with, um, or Cold Mountain, of course, which is um, another one that, you know, I, I love the story. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, I, I think you're, both of what you guys are doing on this topic, I think it dovetails so nicely and so importantly, I wish, you know, Andrew, for your sake that the implementation of being able to do more of these digital studies could get off the ground because we could learn so much for it. Um, you know, you use the term of the spatio-temporal, right, mapping, which sounds kind of scary and, you know, super scholarly, but, you know, explaining how space and time functions on a map can lay some order and reason and explanation to chaos um, and, and clear up some of these um, misconceptions I think people have had for a long time um, about guerrilla warfare. So I wish that that were, were better, both for, you we'll know, get there. mapping guerrilla warfare, but also for the memory component too. I think it would be fascinating to, to map sites of um, memorialization. Um, whatever that might look like, just a plaque or a monument or a grave site um, for some of these gorillas as well. Um, but hopefully better times ahead, right? For a lot of reasons, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you guys so much for, for joining us tonight. Um, and thank you all for, for tuning in. Um, again, the two books that we were talking about, here is Matt's book, The Ghost of Gorilla Memory. And here is- Matt's the other book. <laughs> edited wow. by Matt and um, Joe Beeline with, of course, uh, Andrew's piece about the digital mapping technologies um, that we were talking about. So a lot of good work being produced on, on gorillas um, these days. Um, Barton Myers has done a lot of fascinating work on it as well. And of course, Joe Beeline. Um, so I think there's a lot more coming out for people who might be intrigued by this conversation. Um, but thank you again, guys, and for everyone watching at home, please feel free to, to leave your comments um, and interact with each other, even though we won't be uh, responding live, we always like to hear your feedback um, and hear your reactions. So thank you. Thanks, Ashley. Thank you.